Oh, yes. These are easily identifiable different types of American music. But there is a way of in almost all of our music that is even more basic than its own building blocks. A set of ideas and approaches that address basic components of human life from our national perspective. I'm talking about things like man and womanhood, adolescence, rituals of courtship, war, death, and other timeless fundamentals. I call them sonic metaphors. While not as obvious as a TV show theme or a hit song, they survive the passing of generations and speak clearly across stylistic differences to a singularity of process and purpose. In our freewheeling democracy, where almost every thought is up for debate and skeptical consideration, intentions and meanings are all the more significant. But intentions are like emotions and memories. They inhabit the abstract realm of the invisible, where ideas are powerfully and vividly conceived, but often become mere shadows in the concrete world of words and actions. Well, music is the art of the invisible. It gives shape and focus to our innermost inclinations and can clearly evidence our internal lives with shocking immediacy. The Ghanaian master drummer, Yakub Adi, once described a particular rhythm as a royal rhythm. I said, it doesn't sound royal to me. He replied, brother, that's why you will never play it right. <laughs> he went on to say, when your drummers forgot what different rhythms meant, you lost the powerful tool of community. I asked him, what about the drum machine, Yaku? He said, <laughs> I understood. <laughs> it's important to know what things mean. When someone fixes your favorite meal, the meaning of the meal is more important than how it tastes. When that meal is prepared down through the years, its meaning is reiterated. And so it is with our music. Every listening provides an opportunity for deeper insights into what it means to be American. A national music interprets and tells the national dream. Yes, we are a large nation with many competing agendas, but there are essences in our music that testify to a single national identity. And it took generations of struggle to bind them a long time. They were forged in the scalding fields of American slavery and purified on the blood-soaked battlefields of civil war tested on the frayed bow of an itinerant country fiddler facing a room of skeptical dancers, toughened around western campfires and emboldened by straight-faced pianists in drunken bars, immersed in absurdum on minstrel show stages and apprenticed behind the threadbare curtains of vaudeville houses on Main Street. They learned to cakewalk and boogie-woogie on prissy parlor pianos and were humanized by the broken hearts of common men and women who sang in juke joints and danced the slow drag on sawdust floors, living lives that would have ended in anonymity if it were not for the blues. This music cost us a lot. Yes, these fundamentals were educated in the streets of New Orleans and covered in grease and grit in prison camps, steeled in the mountains of Appalachia, baptized in camp meetings and sanctified by wearers of white robes in the houses of the holy wisened by people with names like Jelly Roll in the houses of ill repute and projected all around this nation through newfangled radios, consolidated by swing bands crisscrossing the country to entertain men and women seeking a good time at the end of a very, very bad time. They were remixed on Broadway, given supersonic thought and fleetness of fingers in small nightclubs crammed onto jam-packed streets in the most crowded city in America, experimented on in jam sessions by people named Monk, and Miles and Mingus. They triumphed on the stages of the greatest concert halls in America with names like Ryman and Carnegie and were legitimized on the fancy dance floors of ballrooms named Palladium and Savoy. Oh yes, huge stadiums were filled with those same elements that were even still being picked on banjos and sang and blown through horns all the way past social upheaval and an invasion of kids with electric guitars from Britain who retook our country the same way Washington's Continental Army had defeated their own redcoats <laughs> with homegrown fundamentals. Yeah, our music went through a lot. It was a train, it was freedom, and it was indeed the world turned upside down. Democratic principles of freedom taking root in the minds of slaves had flowered in the heart of American culture. 
And we turned a deaf ear to the wisdoms in this music because it spoke powerfully and unapologetically to an America we just were not willing to accept. An America that embraced the deepest meanings of her creed. But when it came to acceptance of that national identity, believe me, the musicians were always there first. Jazz was integrated long before baseball, and American music was melded long, long, long before the birth of jazz. With the first slave fiddlers to play an Irish jig, there was democracy. It was with German bandmasters teaching recently freed slaves on Louisiana plantations. It was present when Chano Pozo applied complex Afro-Cuban rhythms to Dizzy Gillespie's bebop. This music was a gift, and the world loved the present, but we Americans just didn't like the package it came in. Why not? It certainly was good enough. It took the lifetime investment of countless citizens to construct the melodies, forms, rhythms, and memories that gird its foundation. It has been amended many times through the years by people with names like Armstrong and Ellington and Gershwin and Goodman and Coltrane, Copeland, and the Carter family. People who were insistent on making our music rich with human meaning, who told us through the depth of their commitment that meaning is the essence of an art, and art is the essence of a people. Huh. New Orleans music is a room full of people talking. And so it is, and so it is. <laughs>